Thank you. I'd like to convene the special board meeting of the Menlo Park Fire Protection District, which is a study session for our um, ethics training, which is required consistent with um, AB 361. So um, at this will be at 503. Roll call, please, Michelle. Director Bernstein is absent. Director Bloom, Bloom is absent. Director Jones? Here. Director Solano? Here. Director Crawley? Present. And we have a quorum. Great. So we do have a quorum. And Nicole, thank you for being here today. Um, so I guess we'll just get to the regular agenda, which is the AB 1234 ethics training. All right. I will share my screen and we can jump right in. Oh, you know, let me make you a co-host really quick. Sorry about okay. that. No problem. Thanks, Michelle. And you should be okay now. And um, Nicole, just so you know, we got the we got this presentation too in our board packet oh, great. for Tuesday's meeting. Perfect. So that just as we jump in, that is really an ethics resource packet, sort of a desk guide for you all to keep. You can take notes on the first few pages as we go through, and um, it includes the slide presentation, it includes the district's conflict of interest code, it includes the most recent FPPC gift guide. So we'll be referencing some of these materials as we go through, but um, hopefully that's a useful tool for you all going forward. Can folks see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. All right. Well, we will jump right in. Good evening, directors. I appreciate you all being here. Um, tonight, I will present your biennial AB 1234 ethics training, which is required by law for local agency officials. Um, the topics we're going to discuss this evening are required by the Attorney General and the California Fair Political Practices Commission. Um, it's also important to note that these laws apply not only to members of the board, but also to staff and where there are distinctions um, in terms of the rules that apply, we'll, we'll raise those for you all. So the impetus for this workshop is AB 1234, but the real purpose of this training is to talk with you all about the tenets of ethical governance. We're going to walk through the basic rules on ethics, but the legal rules here are really only a starting point and our overarching objective is to encourage a heightened sense of what ethical conduct means in public service and how each of you can establish an ethical compass as an internal guide. Um, so we're going to cover a lot of materials. This is a solid two hours <laughs> worth of ethics, um, as you all know. And the goal here isn't to have you all leave feeling like I know all the answers to every question, but rather to give you the high level overview of the law. So you know when um, you know something should set off a red flag or an alarm or raise a question, um, you can obviously reach out to legal counsel for help. Feel free to ask questions as we go. Um, we're going to have a few hypotheticals for us to work through together. And if there's any questions that we can't get through or to in the interest of time, we're happy to follow up. All right. And our first section here is really just sort of our introduction to ethics and scandals. So ethics, what are they? Ethics comes from the Greek word ethos, meaning way of life. The Oxford English Dictionary defines ethics as the moral principles governing or influencing our conduct. And the Ethics Resource Center, which is a nonprofit in DC, considers ethics to be the decisions, choices, and actions we make that reflect our values. So ethics really are our principles manifest through our behavior. Ethical principles really provide our individual conceptions of what's right and what's wrong, moral, immoral, appropriate, inappropriate, and what's what should be legal and illegal. And ethics guide both our public and our private decisions and behavior. It governs everything. It's obviously not limited to the work here with the district. So understanding for each of us how our ethics guide our decision-making it gives us the opportunity to address ethical problems before they arise, plan for how to deal with them on a personal level, and how to regulate them at a governmental level. So the question comes up, where does each of us draw the line between right and wrong in any given situation? And so for this, we I use 
what I call the paperclip example. So I apologize if you've heard me use this before. But the paperclip example is you're in the office and you have a bag and your bag has a number of sort of personal papers and other things. And, you know, you have your wallet in there and your, your water bottle and everything's getting crunched. And what you could really use is just a paperclip. And so you take one off your desk and you put it on your papers and go about the day. And there are people who say, it's one paperclip. It's de minimis. It's not a big deal. It's not a problem. And there are people who say, not one paperclip. So understanding where you fall personally on that spectrum, and frankly, understanding where your colleagues fall on that spectrum is really important to understanding how um, your own ethical compass aligns with the ethical culture of the agency or the um, organization that you're working within. So as public officials, it's just important to be aware you're held to a higher standard. I know you all know this, <laughs> you're community leaders, you set the example um, in the ethics arena and we're expected to demonstrate moral courage. And if we don't, quite frankly, public officials are the first to be tarred, feathered and used as scapegoats to explain why government isn't doing what it's supposed to be doing. So this is really incredibly important when it comes to the functioning of, um, of the public's business. So, it's important, as I said, to kind of think about what sets off your ethics alarm and to be aware that you don't need to sort of test your conduct right up to the absolute limits under the law, that we're going to kind of work through these, um, these legal requirements with you, but they're just the minimum. And many individuals and many agencies choose to do more. Um, and so understanding that, understanding where you are, understanding what might keep you up at night, what would make you uncomfortable if you had to explain it, you know, at the dinner table, those kind of softer aspects of this, it's important to understand where you fall um, on all of those issues. So every public agency or organization will develop its own ethical culture. And some agencies approach ethics more formally by adopting or developing some kind of a code or policies. And so generally speaking, there are two approaches to these codes. There's values-based codes versus rules-based codes. Rules-based codes are, they speak in terms of the don'ts, things that you shouldn't do. So laws are rules-based. Values-based codes speak more in terms of the uh, priorities, the aspirations, the do's. And so the concept underlying this is that values-based codes serve as a positive complement to the framework of ethics laws in California. So generally speaking, modern ethicists start with what I have up here, these building blocks of universal ethical values, fairness, loyalty, compassion, trustworthiness, responsibility, respect. And what this means in the context of a public agency so fairness is that's merit-based decisions, treating people fairly. Loyalty is putting the agency first ahead of your own uh, personal interests. Compassion is being flexible where it's appropriate. Trustworthiness, being truthful, not doing things that'll cause members of the public to question an official's personal interests. Responsibility, that's efficient use of resources. Maintaining confidentiality is appropriate. And then respect, being courtesy, courteous, listening to stakeholders. And by having these conversations, we begin to kind of understand how morals and values and ethics um, really governs the ethical culture of the district. Now, I think we can probably all think of a few or more than a few examples of public officials who become embroiled in scandals, um, you know, based in violations of the law. And I, you know, I, feel a little silly saying it because it's so well known, but these examples are always salacious. It's always front page news. And in an environment where we have a 24 hour news cycle and the internet, frankly, it's really difficult for an agency to recover from the reputational harm that comes with these types of scandals. So an ethical black eye can stick with an agency for decades. And it's important to think about that when you're thinking about how these types of um, issues and problems and violations of the law can impact not just the individual, but the work of the agency for a long time to come. 
So because government is subject to intense public scrutiny, when something goes wrong and a leader's ethics are questioned, there's very often pressure on the government to do something. So usually there's an investigation, public shaming, probably um, some sort of prosecution in the judicial system. And very often it leads to some form of talk about how, there sh how things should have been different. And people will say things like there ought to be a law to deal with that. And so in cases where there wasn't a law or when the, where the law didn't really capture the issue, government very well may respond by making a law, which is how we ended up with a lot of the government ethics laws that are on the book. They are sort of reactive in nature in response to something. They are overlapping. And so it is not very, uh, they're not incredibly easy to intuit or to, to understand. Um, they can be pretty complicated to work through. And it is because of this sort of patchwork quilt nature of the ethics laws. And then it's just important to remember, as I said, the laws in this area are the minimum standards. Ch agencies choose to do more. And that's because both legally and from a reputational perspective, appearances matter. These laws are getting at the appearance of impropriety and many agencies um, hold that appearance of impropriety or the appearance of propriety to be um, the most important thing. The building and maintaining that trust with the public is critical. And it's also important to know that, you know, these laws may be reactive in nature, but the body that is charged with developing the regulations is very often the body that enforces many of these laws, the California Fair Political Practices Commission. So I think these folks do spend a lot of time and have a great breadth of expertise in trying to apply these laws and develop regulations in a way that um, makes sense and is functional for, for public agencies. All right, so our first topic here, our substantive topic will be government transparency. So the ethical values that we are talking about here are responsibility and respect. And California transparency laws are centered on the principle that government works for the public and it should be open to the public. So these laws cover open meetings, public records, and then FPPC compliance reports, disclosure reports. So first we're going to start with open meetings, the Brown Act. The Brown Act governs all meetings of local legislative bodies, such as boards, commissions, and standing committees, including any advisory committees formed by formal action of the board. The Brown Act requires that all meetings of a legislative body must be open to the public, properly noticed with a written agenda that's available to the public for a specified time period prior to the meeting, and that the meeting must allow time for public comment. So if a meeting is a special meeting, the Brown Act requires the agenda to be posted 24 hours in advance of the meeting. The, uh, the notice needs to be posted on the agency's website if they have one, and the call on notice must specify the time and place of the special meeting and the business to be transacted or discussed. If a meeting is a regular meeting, then the Brown Act requires the agenda to be posted 72 hours in advance. But it's important to know that there's recent case law or relatively recent case law that indicates that substantial compliance is okay. So in this case, you know, we could, it's probably okay if it were 71 hours instead of 72 or 23. Um, and then if there is a violation of the Brown Act or an alleged violation of the Brown Act, the agency would have the opportunity to cure and correct the, um, the issue. But if we have a violation of the Brown Act, the penalties include potentially invalidating the action and depending on kind of the facts and the context, um, possible misdemeanor charges, it really comes down to sort of a willfulness on the part of the agency or the board to hide information from the public. So you need that kind of intentional um, behavior to rise to that level. So as we all know, at the start of the COVID pandemic, the governor issued a number of executive orders to modify the Brown Act's um, teleconference requirements, and those were replaced by AB 361. AB 361 allows an agency to use teleconferencing for public meetings without requiring the teleconference location to be accessible to the public, 
or requiring a quorum of the members of the body to participate from locations within the boundaries of the jurisdiction during the proclaimed emergency. So agencies can rely on AB 361 in the following circumstances. The legislative body holds a meeting during a proclaimed state of emergency and state or local officials have imposed recommended measures to promote social distancing. The legislative body holds a meeting during a proclaimed state of emergency to determine by a majority vote whether as a result of the emergency meeting in person would present imminent risks to health or safety of attendees or the legislative body holds a meeting during a proclaimed state of emergency and has already determined by, an, by a majority vote that as a result of the emergency meeting and um, meeting in person would present eminent risks to health or safety of the attendees. So as I think we can all see and we all know the proclaimed state of emergency is kind of the essential first element. And then there's other ways to get um, within the kind of cover of AB 361 here. So under AB 361, the agendas have to have the address of the meeting, but in this case, it's gonna be a web address or a call in information. And then there's multiple ways that you can sort of manage public comment during meetings, as I think we all know and are well practiced in at this point. So it's important to make sure that there's a process in place that we are able to address issues of reasonable modifications for folks with disabilities, and then we have tools to ensure that members of the legislative body and staff are able to hear and be heard, avoiding interruptions, you know, muting attendees when needed, maybe using different call-in lines, different things like that to kind of manage this. And then obviously, as I think we are all very practiced in just, you know, packing your patients because it's like things can go wrong and they often do and being prepared for those kind of technical staff is important. Oops, did I skip one? No, that's right. All right. So once the COVID-19 state of emergency expires um, at the end of February, agencies will have two options for remote participation. The first is the use of the traditional Brown Act teleconference rules. So a quorum of the members of the legislative body must be within the boundaries of the local agency. The agenda must identify the teleconference location. The agenda must be posted at the teleconference location. The teleconference location must be accessible to the public and the public must be allowed to participate in the meeting from the teleconference location. Those are our traditional rules. Alternatively, agencies can use the newly enacted rules under AB 2449, um, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But it's also important to know that agencies can hold hybrid meetings where members of the public or staff participate remotely while board members and anyone else participate in person. And agencies obviously can also broadcast their meetings um, for the convenience of the public. I think you know, one of the upsides in relying on AB 361 over the past couple of years is that we really have seen that there's an opportunity here to really expand public access to um, meetings of different uh, special districts or public agencies. And um, so I think folks are, are focused on and looking at ways to maintain some of that continued flexibility, including through, for example, hybrid meetings or broadcasting and that technology is a little bit more developed than maybe it was three years ago. So the new teleconference alternative, and I know Steve has talked to you all about this, but under AB 2449, a board member may only participate by teleconference for just cause or in emergency circumstances and must publicly announce that justification at the start of the meeting. And those circumstances are family or medical leave, child care or caregiving needs, disability, official travel, or sickness. A board member can only use these options twice per calendar year per board member. At least a quorum of the board must participate in person at a publicly accessible location, and the teleconferencing uh, board member must participate through both audio and visual technology, and they need to disclose whether anyone in the room at their remote location, um, whether there are any individuals in the room who are over 18 at their remote location. 
And then the agenda must identify and include a way for all persons to attend and address the legislative body via that two-way system and at the in-person location. Um, and if the broadcast is disrupted, then the legislative body can't take further action until the broadcast is restored. So I think in many ways, particularly the technological elements of this law are pretty onerous for many agencies, especially smaller agencies, being able to do that audio visual component is particularly challenging. Um, so I think it is still a bit of an open question how useful AB 2449 will be going forward, but we have start to, started to see agencies relying on it as folks are transitioning from AB 361 to in person and need to still, you know, um, deal with many of the emergency circumstances that they've listed here. So there are some limited exceptions to the general rule that uh, public agencies meetings must be open to the public. Those are closed session exceptions that I've listed here on the slide. Um, and it's just important to remember that any, pers any papers, any information, anything like that that's distributed in closed session needs to remain confidential. And that it's a violation of the Brown Act to share any closed um, session information with folks who aren't eligible to be a party to the closed session. So it's important when thinking about the Brown Act, not just to think about it in terms of what the requirements are, but to also be aware of what the potential pitfalls are. So the first and kind of main pitfall is really a quorum of the board talking about the agency's business outside of a notice meeting. And this has sort of a secondary element of appearance that is worth being mindful of. So, you know, I think it's pretty straightforward in that, you know, a, a quorum of the board shouldn't leave a boardroom continuing to talk about the agency's business. That's, that's, you know, pretty straightforward, pretty clear. But you also need to be, I think, mindful of appearances and what does it look like if a quorum of the board is sort of quietly talking off in the corner at a um, at a social gathering or something like that, even if they're not talking about the agency's business, it can give the appearance that they are. And so being aware of what that looks like, just being a little bit cognizant of it, having, having your radar tuned to those issues can be really important to maintaining trust with the public. Um, and then secondly, I wanna talk about serial conversations which are really, it's a circumstance in which at least a quorum of the directors talk with each other about the same business in one-on-one -on -one conversations, sequential conversations. So um, the instances in which that come up, that issue comes up here, are really the daisy chain. So one board member talks to another, talks to another, talks to another until you reach a quorum of the board or the hub and spoke where you have a hub who speaks to one and then to another and then to another until they reach a quorum of the board. And so if the hub is a board member, then just communicating to a quorum of the board about the topic um, would violate the Brown Act. But the hub could also be staff, a reporter, a member of the public. And in that case, it would violate the Brown Act if the hub communicates from one to another what the other director said. So director so-and-so said they're going to vote this way. How are you going to vote on this matter? Once you share that information across a quorum of the board, um, you would have a serial conversation under that hub and spoke model. So I think as you all, I'm sure, are very well versed, you'll see when staff briefs the board uh, or less than a quorum of the board, they'll be careful not to share information across different board members for exactly that reason. Uh, but it's also important if you all are having conversations with each other to just be aware, who have you talked to? What have you talked to? Like, have you talked about this issue with them? And just kind of doing that little bit of vetting can go a long way. Next, uh, email. It's really important to be cautious with email. Email communications um, provide such an easy forum for talking with a group. And these conversations can really very quickly become meetings subject to the Brown Act or serial conversations. So um, I think it's, it is easy to assume that no one will ever learn about these types of communications. But as I've kind of said throughout and tried to highlight, you know, if there is violations of the Brown Act can really be damaging to the public's trust in an agency. And so that 
where you have that kind of a breakdown, it can really compromise the work of the agency. And so it's just important to be extra cautious, be aware of it, you know, keep to the safe practices of allowing staff to communicate um, with the board to just be attentive to this issue. All right. Um, so from the perspective of social media, we've had a relatively recent change, um, effective January 1st of 2021. Um, AB 992 amends the Brown Act to provide that the prohibition on a majority of members of a legislative body using a series of communications of any kind directly or through intermediaries to discuss or take action on an item that's within the subject matter jurisdiction of the legislative body outside of a properly noticed meeting, that that prohibition doesn't prevent a member of the legislative body from engaging in separate conversations or communications on a social media platform in order to answer questions from the public regarding a matter that's within the subject matter jurisdiction of the agency, provided that a majority of the members of the legislative body don't use the social media platform to discuss amongst themselves the business of a specific nature that's within the subject matter jurisdiction of the legislative body, and that a member of the legislative body doesn't respond directly to any communication um, on a social media platform from another board member. And that can include anything like, you know, giving a thumbs up or, um, and, or even, or a more, you know, complete reply. All right, public records. So the California Public Records Act gives the public the right to inspect and copy public records. Public records include all non-exempt writings or other records in any format concerning the public's business that are owned or retained by a state or local agency. So this includes email and could include metadata. And several years ago, really almost 10 years ago now, the California Supreme Court determined that information concerning, an, concerning the agency's business that's located on a public official's personal device or account is a public record subject to disclosure under the Public Records um, Act. So the test is the content, not the location of the information that dictates whether or not it's a public record. So emails on personal email accounts, text messages, on personal devices, anything like that that contains the public's business are considered public records for the purposes of the act. Certain types of records are exempt from disclosure, such as personnel records, trade secrets, records that are subject to the deliberative process or within the, the sort of purview of the deliberative process, privilege documents, and then records that fall under the general catch-all exemption which applies when the public's interest in non-disclosure substantially outweighs the interest in disclosure. There are statutory deadlines for responding to public records um, act requests, so it's always important to be prompt in cooperating with the district's process if there is a request. And then the last topic I wanted to cover in this section is really the required financial disclosures. Many of you may know these as like Form 700, um, high level public officials are required to disclose financial interests in part to better protect against conflicts of interest, which I'm going to talk about. Um, and these disclosures, they're generally needed upon assuming office annually while in office and upon leaving office. Um, oh, I see. Uh, Director Jones, you have a, through the chair, if you have a question. Robert? I do. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I it's been burning. It's a burning my mind up, and I just wonder before we get on too far. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's go back to the Brown Act, I guess. Um, and you mentioned uh, the uh, quorum outside of the, final, of the notice meeting. You mentioned conference uh, exception, but then you, uh, I didn't quite get what the improper use of ad hoc committees. I, I, I maybe it's. It talked about it, but I kind of missed that part of it, as sure. well as on the serial conversation, uh, the social media rule uh, in terms of just kind of highlight that. Sure. You said. Sure. So the improper use of ad hoc committees, ad hoc committees generally are not subject to the Brown Act. They're not Brown Act committees, but it's important to be cautious because 
you want to be sure that you don't have something that is effectively a standing committee that's just called an ad hoc committee for the purposes of trying to slide out underneath the Brown Act requirements. Similarly, it's important to know that something can be an ad hoc committee in title, but if formed by formal action of the board, it is subject to the Brown Act. So it's important to just kind of understand that the limited scope of the ad hoc committee exception is just that limited. And that, you know, the any committee that um, purports to be outside of the requirements of the Brown Act because it's an ad hoc committee, you just wanna be careful that in fact, you are meeting all of the requirements to hit that. Is the distinction uh, in terms of um, limited scope or limited time frame versus um, uh, ongoing kind of a committee. That's exactly right. That's generally the distinction between an ad hoc committee versus a standing committee. And so you do want to think about, well, is this actually an ad hoc committee? Does it fit that limited scope, limited time period, those parameters, or is this something that is, you know, going to stay in place for a long time such that it actually functions as a standing committee? So, so for example, I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, please clarity. do. Uh, so it, in our process, we typically have um, a year from January to December in a in a uh, in our committees, and if the ad hoc committee is 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 uh, developed, uh, would it without without uh, stating would it last as long as that committee have a purpose or or or, or uh, objectives to to fulfill? Um, for example, would they stay if they say we want to add our committee in January and it doesn't get to the end of that committee until December, would that be a regular committee process or would it go beyond that or, or does it have a shorter time frame? I think it would probably be very, it would depend on the facts of the specific purpose that the committee is serving. I could see an argument where a standing committee has kind of what could be a longer term, I'm sorry, an ad hoc committee has what could be viewed as a longer term just because it is outside of a year. But if that purpose is served by, is being served specifically by that ad hoc committee, then I could see an argument that it's still an ad hoc committee. So mm -hmm. I, I guess I would say I would, we I think we would have to look at the facts to see whether or not we're still fitting within that exception. I see, okay, thank you. And then the social media piece, I just wanted to answer that. That was the new rules under AB 992, allowing board members to use social media um, to communicate about the agency's business, receive information from the public, ask questions, respond to questions, just so long as the board isn't, or a quorum of the board isn't discussing amongst themselves on a social media platform, the agency's business and individual board members aren't responding to each other. So that was that um, piece. So that means that, if I, if I may, that means that a, a, we have our, um, our uh, sanctioned uh, media for the district. Our board members are allowed to have their own kind of sub, you know, uh, I don't know, so Facebook page or whatever, just talking about issues uh, that that comes up or is part of uh, that comes out of our meetings. So uh, under California law, yes, if you wanted to use your, a social media platform to communicate about the agency's business, you could do that. If the board had its own different rules that limited um, a board member's use of social media or anything like that, that would be just kind of separate. But under California law, yes, that's right. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? I think we're actually at a pretty good pausing point in terms of our our uh, agenda this evening. So. Okay. I, I read through the whole thing, so I got other questions down. There. I appreciate it. I'm ready. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Um, part three, personal financial gain, also known as conflicts of interest. So there are two main bodies of law in California that govern conflicts of interest and financial disclosure. The first is government code section 1090, which prohibits public officials from engaging in acts that would result in self-dealing and the political reform act, which establishes rules for when a public official is disqualified from participating in a governmental decision due to that official's financial interest. 
Um, and then, as I said before, the Political Reform Act also requires public officials to report certain financial interests on an annual basis, in part to help protect against these conflicts of interest. So these laws are really ensured, they're designed to ensure that, that public officials perform their duties in an impartial manner and they don't benefit from, um, financially benefit from their positions. So the goal here is not just to prohibit the actual impropriety, but also the appearance of impropriety. I said it before, I'll say it again. Appearances <laughs> matter. They have real impacts, real tangible impacts on the agency. And that's why these laws address the appearance of impropriety as well. Um, and in addition to contracting and government decisions, these laws also address um, conflicts of interest based on campaign contributions. We talked about the Levine Act a few days ago. That's that piece. And then also um, bribery. So first we will talk about Government Code Section 1090, Self-Dealing and Contracts. This applies both to directors and to district employees, but the rules are a little bit different. So this prohibition against self-dealing codifies the long established common law rule that public officials shall not be financially interested in any contract made by them in their official capacity or by any body or board of which they're members. And this pivotal rule is very broadly interpreted by the courts. It's important to know that, that each element of this, the board or the courts have interpreted very broadly. Um, and, you know, I guess simply stated, you may not have a financial interest in any contract made by you or by the district. There are a number of statutory exceptions to this rule that we would analyze in any, um, whenever any section 1090 question comes up. But it's important to know that this also applies to your spouse's interests and your dependent child's interests as well. And if there is a circumstance, if there are circumstances that constitute a 1090 violation, the consequences are very severe. So first, when we're looking at the issue and of whether or not there's a um, conflict of interest under government code section 1090, we ask, is there a financial interest? And the statute, unfortunately, doesn't tell us what a financial interest is. So we look at case law, we look at attorney general opinions and try to uh, discern from that whether or not there is a financial interest. And then if there is, is there a remote interest or a statutory non-interest exception that applies? So the remote interests only apply to the board and they allow the agency to proceed with the contract if the board member complies with certain recusal and disclosure requirements. And the non-interest exceptions apply to both board members and district employees. And effectively, it's sort of a codification of what would otherwise be financial interests, but the legislature has said these aren't financial interests. So for the purposes of the statute, these don't count. And what if there is a 1090 conflict? So if there is, the 1090, Government Code Section 1090 really presents board members in the districts with one of two choices. Either the district decides against entering into the contract or you resign from your position. There is no middle ground. For staff, staff has the option to recuse themselves so that the agency could still continue with the contract. That's one of those distinctions that is um, important. And then I guess really, as you I think would expect from the kind of fundamental offensiveness of a, of a public official using their influence to gain financial advantage through self-dealing, the penalties here are really very severe. The district attorney can bring criminal action with potential felony charges that could result in fines, jail time, loss of office, as well as a prohibition against ever running for office again. In addition, under civil action, you could have injunctive relief. The contract would be void, not voidable. So if both sides had attorneys, the terms are all reasonable. <clears throat> doesn't matter. The contract would be void. And the contracting party, contra the party that has performed work under this contract, can't keep any of the money that they've earned. They have to return that to the agency, at which point they're very likely going to turn around and sue the individual with a conflict of interest. So it gets very messy very quickly. And the, the 
the penalties, the outcomes here are, are very, very draconian. So it's just important to know that anytime anything on the agenda implicates something on your statement of economic interest, that should raise a red flag. Okay, any, um, I'm just about to move on to the Political Reform Act, so I wanted to ask if there's any questions before I do on 1090. So, so if cousin if cousin Bob uh, has a, some property they want to buy from the district, and and, and Director Crowley is um, in that in that chain of family relationship, would she have to recuse herself at that point in time? So, the question there under 1090, first of all, for Director Crowley, there is no recusal option. So. For any director, there is no option to recuse yourself under Government Code Section 1090. That would be a uh, Political Reform Act option. But what you would be looking at is really the nature of the relationship and whether or not she has a financial interest in that contract. And if it is her cousin's um, company in that case, right, and that individual wants to contract with the agency and there is no financial um, entanglement of any type, then it may be that she doesn't actually have a financial interest in that case. You probably ask the very real question of, you know, are there other issues here like bias or anything else? But um, in terms of government code section 1090, there may not be if that doesn't rise to the level of a uh, financial interest. Okay. All right. Thank you. But I think you'd also ask, does this look good? Does this, does this pass muster from an appearances perspective? And that that in and of itself may be enough. Okay, good, thank you. Mm -hmm. So under uh, 1090, it really used to be that we had to rely on court cases and AG opinions to get any kind of guidance. Uh, about 10 years ago, the FPPC was given the authority to, um, to provide opinions and advice on government code section 1090. And, you know, there was sort of a ramp up period where they were catching up and kind of getting building expertise in this area of the law. And since then, they have developed and issued a number of 1090 letters, which are very helpful. There are some very complicated and gray areas of government code section 1090, considering, for example, you know, a is a consultant hired by the district, a public official, and how do we sort of contract in a way that allows the agency to do what it needs to do without potentially running into 1090 issues um, down that line. There's a lot here that is kind of messy and thorny and, and challenging, and the FPPC has acknowledged that this is a, an evolving area of the law and a difficult one. So um, I think on the whole, it's really a good thing that we have another source, another a regulator um, providing advice and guidance on this area of the law because um, you know you want to be careful and it's important and helpful to get more input. All right, so we have a hypothetical here. Our staff member says, as you know, the district has outgrown its current space for record storage and wants to lease a new storage facility for all of its paper records located at 100 Woodland Avenue in Grovesville, California. Staff proposes that the district rent the storage facility located at that address. And our director says, wait a minute, I think Director Owen Owens owns the facility. Can the board of directors authorize the fire chief to execute the lease? What do we think? I, well, I guess Virginia got unmuted, go ahead. No, I mean, I would say no, even though I mean, because a director owns it, or I mean, either you can't get into the contract or the director has to resign. Right. That's exactly right. Government Code Section 1090 prohibits public officials from participating and making a contract, contract, which in this case, a lease would be, in which they have a financial interest. And if there is no statutory exception that applies, and there wouldn't be under these facts, then the contract is prohibited from the outset. So that's exactly, exactly it. All right. Our next topic is uh, avoiding conflicts of interest in government decisions. So the Political Reform Act was enacted in 1974 in response to Watergate. And the purpose of the act is really to eliminate the possibility of public officials influencing government decisions to serve their own financial interest. 
So the act establishes rules for disqualifying officials from decision making. And as I've said, requires this kind of annual reporting to help surface in daylight some of these potential conflicts. So um, I guess just at the outset, you have 1090, which deals with conflicts, and the Political Reform Act, which deals with government decisions. There is obviously a world in which they overlap, where you have a government decision that is also making a contract, but they also can be very separate. So when we look at issues of conflict of interest, we look under both of these rubrics to see whether or not, and you could have a conflict of interest under both, under one, not the other, different rules may apply. So the basic rule here, is that a public official may not make, participating, participate in making, or in any way use or attempt to use their official position to influence a government decision when they have a disqualifying financial interest. And an individual has a disqualifying financial interest in a governmental decision if the decision will have a reasonably foreseeable material financial effect on the official, official that is distinguishable from the effect on the public agency. So. Each of those sort of phrases that I kind of paused at have are their own tests, their own set of regulations, and it's an incredibly fact-specific analysis to break that down to determine whether or not there is um, a conflict of interest under the Political Reform Act. So in applying the law, there used to be an eight-step test. Now there's a four-step test with two precursors. The first precursor is is the person a public official? You all are public officials. And is there a financial interest? And then here we've listed out the financial interest, which, you know, unlike 1090, this is pretty straightforward. It's very helpful to have. And then we move to the four step analysis. So this is where things get much more complicated. So, first, is the effect on the official's financial interest reasonably foreseeable? If the financial interest is explicitly involved in the transaction, then the financial effect is presumed to be reasonably foreseeable. If the interest is not explicitly involved, then the likelihood that the, dis that the decision will have an effect on your financial interest should be a realistic possibility that is more than hypothetical or theoretical. So that's just about as confusing as it sounds. And the next question is, is it material? So for each of those different financial interests, there's a different set of tests for materiality. And the materiality regulations are updated very regularly. So you want to make sure you're looking at the right set. I think many of you are familiar with the old 500 foot rule when it comes to real property. That's changed. Now there's three different categories. Um, but generally speaking, you're going to look at whether or not um, your financial interest is named in the matter. If it is, then it's probably material. And if it's not, then you're going to consider these materiality factors that generally kind of boil down to, is there going to be a value or a change as a result in the, in the decision? But as I said, it's really important to make sure that you're looking at the regulations and, um, and being sure that you're kind of working through the analysis. And then, oh, I'm sorry. Nicole, when they mm -hmm. say explicitly involved, I mean, what what does that mean? Explicitly involved uh, usually means named, okay. named in the transaction. Okay. Uh, so the next piece here is really um, is the effect on the official the same on the effect as the on the public generally. So. Will this decision hit your pocketbook in the same way that it will hit the uh, pocketbooks of a certain portion of the population within the jurisdiction? So you all serve on the board of the direct of directors that approves a fire prevention fee schedule. That will impact you in the same way as it'll impact the public generally. So uh, in that case, the uh, there wouldn't be a conflict of interest there. And then <clears throat> lastly, is the official making, participating in making, or using his or her position to influence the governmental decision from which the financial effect results? So this is broadly interpreted. It can be anything from a wink and a nod to formal action. So it's important to know that um, that making or participating in making or attempting to influence, you know, that can that encompasses quite a bit. And then what if there is a conflict of interest under the um, 
Political Reform Act, it's really important to consult with legal counsel as soon as possible, because as we've said, this is a very nuanced, fact-intensive analysis. Um, in addition to that, the FPPC has an enforcement, um, well, like a, a hotline number that you can call and ask questions. And so if you were to present sort of a set of circumstances to them through that informal means, very often they will tell you like, oh, you know, that sounds a lot like this. Why don't you go check out this regulation? It can be really helpful. That's informal guidance, different from, you know, writing a formal letter and getting advice that you might be able to rely on in the event there's a challenge. And it's also just really important to remember that having a conflict of interest doesn't mean you've done something wrong. It's problematic when you don't deal with the conflict appropriately. We all have, you know, we may have income, we may have real property, we may have all sorts of different financial interests. And it's just important to make sure that we're aware of them and deal with them appropriately um, in order to make sure that we don't have other larger issues. So if there is a conflict of interest, um, you would need to publicly identify the financial interest that gives rise to the conflict immediately prior to consideration of the matter, leave the room until after the matter is concluded, recuse yourself from the discussion and abstain from voting. So it used to be that the language of the regulations allowed someone to leave the room in advance of an item or to only join after, and then they wouldn't have to disclose that financial interest, but the regulations were modified. And now if you leave the room before the item is considered, you still have to disclose your interest. And if you join the meeting after, you have to disclose your, disclose your interest at that time. And then there are you know, pretty steep penalties and serious consequences if there is a failure to report and properly recuse. Um, I think we've sort of generally seen that the FPPC has expressed an interest in focusing on, you know, big fish, really large issues. Um, but nevertheless, there are pretty substantial fines, personal consequences in terms of the impacts to the reputation of the individual and the agency. The action could be invalidated. Um, the consequences here are, are very, very steep. All right, so another hypothetical. Our staff member says, as you all know, the district has outgrown its current space for record storage and wants to lease a new storage facility for all of its paper records located at 100 Woodland Avenue in Grovesville, California. Staff proposes the district rent the storage facility located at that address. And our director says, wait a minute, I think the CFO owns that building. Can the board of directors authorize the fire chief to execute the lease? What do we think? Yes. That is right. So this is a little bit of a different take on a similar question. So here we're talking about the CFO, an employee. So under government code section 1090, they could arguably recuse themselves. I think we you know, have a probably broader discussion as to whether or not someone at the level of the CFO could actually sort of build a firewall around themselves um, to properly recuse themselves. But in theory, they could. And under the Political Reform Act, they could recuse themselves. And they also can't be involved in any kind of tenant improvements on the property or anything like that. So under this slightly different set of facts, the district can enter into the lease. Although again, issues of appearance are um, important to consider. Nicole, uh, mm -hmm. in order to kind of uh, build that firewall, what, uh, I guess uh, against the district and, and would, in that situation, would there have to be some evidence of, uh, what's, what do you want to say? Should, should we at that point require extra validation of why that piece of property or why that particular mm um location versus some other location uh, mm -hmm. I mean, because oftentimes you know sometimes as a real estate agent i know you bring a buyer three different types of options to choose from mm -hmm. or four uh mm -hmm. as a board it, it, it should we just make i guess and you would assume that that would happen but as a board member it seemed like we probably need to 
really make sure and look at those other documentation or other options that are out there and to, to have the CFO walk through each one of them or whoever is in charge of you know, bringing that, that particular option, walk us through each one of them to, to try to get a comparison to understand that is this the best option? Is this the only option that's, that's convenient for us? I mean, well, can, can I piggyback on that? I mean, would the CFO even be a, the appropriate person if he owns the property? Because doesn't the CFO have to recuse him or herself completely from the discussion? Right. So I think it's a really good suggestion, a really good point. I think what you're really focusing in on is the fact that where you have a conflict or a potential conflict of interest, then you have to be concerned about how pub the public is going to view this. And so it makes sense to try and shore up the argument for going with this particular option and why that is in the public's interest, even though there is this conflict of interest. So I could see a really good argument for going through in a public fashion, the steps of saying, you know, this is why we're making this choice. This is why financially it's the best decision. Operationally, it's the best decision, whatever the, the supporting reasons are that the board might want to go through that process. I could also see if we're talking about something that is a storage facility and maybe one storage facility is as good as another, it might be more important to preserve the appearance of propriety and the and the agency's reputation and to just pick another option. I think to, to Director Chen Crowley's point about whether or not the, the CFO is the right person to go through that process, that's exactly right. If the CFO has a financial interest, maybe they aren't the right person to present it. And you also want to look at, I think, and take a hard look at whether or not that person, whether we could properly um, build a firewall around that person or whether that's just not practically speaking a, a workable option such that the board or the district should consider a different facility. You know, there's, I think all of that makes good sense and all goes towards the ultimate goal of doing everything you can to preserve the, the reputation and the trust that the public has with the agency. Okay. Um, another hypothetical here. So our director says, as you know, the district is partnering with the cities in our jurisdiction to hold a joint fire season awareness event in Civic Center Park, and we want to hire events for you to put on the program. My primary residence is right across the street from where the event will be held. And our fire chief asks legal counsel, can the director participate in discussions related to this contract? What do folks think? How far away is it? That's exactly the question. We're going to go to our materiality regulations. So it's across the street. I guess it depends on how big of a street we're talking about here. But um, the, when you're looking at the analysis here, under 1090, we don't have a problem because the director isn't a named party. This isn't a contract with them. This isn't a con This is a contract with events for you. But they're making a governmental decision on that contract. And so we need to look at whether or not the FPPC regulations on materiality and, the, and financial interest in real property. So as I said, you all are probably familiar with the old 500 foot rule. Now we have a new rule that is broken out into three different steps. So first, if your property is located 500 feet or less from the property at issue in the governmental decision, there is a presumption that the financial decision is material. If your property is located more than a thousand feet from the property at issue, there is a presumption that the financial uh, effect of the decision is not material. Both of those presumptions can be rebutted with clear and convincing evidence. And if your property is located more than 500 feet, but less than a thousand feet from the property at issue, then we look at um, whether or not the financial effect on your property or whether the decision would change the parcels um, developmental potential, development potential, income producing potential, highest and best use, market value, or character by substantially altering traffic, intensity of use, parking, view, privacy, noise, air quality. So in this context, we're talking about a fire season awareness event. 
it probably wouldn't really change any of the um, the particular elements that we're looking at related to this parcel. But if this turned out to be a you know blockbuster event that was repeated over several weeks, the you know Woodstock of fire season awareness events, then you could see how it might start to change and how that impact might um, might start to tilt in the in the direction of materiality. So uh, you know it's highly fact specific <laughs> as always. Okay. So that's the Political Reform Act. I'm going to move on to the Levine Act unless uh, folks have questions about the, the specific conflict of interest rules that we just went through. OK, so this should be familiar to you all. Um, we covered this just a couple of days ago at the board meeting. So the Levine Act addresses, it really encompasses the pay to play rules of the Political Reform Act. and the. Um, Levine Act provides that no officer shall accept, solicit, or direct a contribution of $250 or more, or more than $250, excuse me, from a party while the proceeding is pending or for 12 months after the final decision if the officer knows or has reason to know that the participant has a financial interest in the proceeding and an officer may not participate in or influence a decision if the financially interested party has contributed more than $250 within the past 12 months and officers must report and recuse themselves. So this co covers campaign contributions to, well, just campaigns, officers and on or on behalf of committees. And then in terms of the proceedings that we're talking about, these are business, professional, trade, and land use licenses and permits, entitlements for use, non-exempt exempt contracts, and franchises. And then the exceptions are competitively bid contracts, so low bid contracts where there isn't really the opportunity to um, exercise any influence, and uh, contracts for labor or personal employment. And um, I think it's important this obviously has this statute has changed recently in that it used to only apply to appointed officials so if someone was elected to the city council and from that position appointed to another uh, board they would only worry about the Levine Act when they were sitting in their appointed capacity now it applies equally to both you need to worry about the requirements of the Levine Act, whether you're sitting on your directly elected board or on your appointed board. And then, as I think we discussed, the the tail on this, the uh, the prohibition on accepting campaign contributions in excess of two hundred and fifty dollars was extended from three months to twelve months. So we have a longer tail to think about here. Um, and. I think with the change in the law, the recent change in the law, the FPPC, um, and this is completely anecdotal, but I think that there has been an acknowledgement that there's a need for more clarity. And I think we'll start to see that. I think we'll start to see more regulations, more guidance on how to apply the Levine Act. Um, so it may be that in the coming months and years that we're able to give you all more um, from the FPPC on what the parameters are, more guidance, more rules of the road. But in the meantime, um, as I mentioned on Tuesday, the district has included a new form for proposers to fill out um, so that we can know in advance of bringing any contract to the board whether or not their a recusal may be appropriate. Are there any questions on this item? Yeah, Nicole, mm -hmm. Rob. Yeah, um, does this also, uh, if if a federal official runs in California, of course, this applies also, right? Like if, if someone candidate, runs for it applies to Canada. It. Sorry, go ahead. Finish your question. No, no. I mean, well, let's say someone's running for Congress or the Senate in California. This applies, correct? Uh, it only applies to agencies, California public agencies. So it wouldn't apply, the Congress has their own rules and the federal government has its own sets of rules in terms of what applies for um, uh, conflicts of interest there. So uh, the agency definition is, is limited to California agencies. 
Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is an area in which we hope to have more Wait. for you all. Mm -hmm. Yes, Sorry, and Nicole, ahead. do you anticipate any more changes in it for this Levine Act? We certainly could see more changes. Okay, so you'll act. just I, keep us updated like last on will. Tuesday, right? Exactly, exactly. I think we could see changes in that we get more or better different guidance from the FPPC. We could also see cleanup statutes being proposed um, because I think folks do have a lot of questions yes. about how this applies now that there's more attention on it. So I, I think it's a there's a good chance that we will have more for you. Hey, Rob, I see your hand up. Did you have anything else or is that from a leftover question? It's a leftover, thanks. Sorry. Okay. Thanks. All right. Um, future employment. So you can also have a conflict of interest in future employment. So a public official cannot participate in decisions involving future employers. And under the Political Reform Act, this applies to all public officials, including public employees. They have a financial interest in prospective employers and can't be involved in making decisions that will have a material financial effect on a prospective employer. So the question here usually comes down to whether or not a uh, company is, in fact, a pr prospective employer. And so the key question is really, how far into the process are you? Looking at a company on LinkedIn won't trigger this ban, but sitting down and having an interview with a prospective employer certainly might. Getting an offer probably will. So these are the things we sort of look at where folks are in the process to determine whether or not um, they would need to recuse themselves from a decision. And we have, you know, we know that this can be a sensitive area, particularly with staff. And so we've helped our clients to kind of do this in a way that still preserves some um, confidence. And then in addition to that, um, public officials can't represent clients or employers before the agency if the, the that the official formerly worked for for one year, and this is known as the revolving door prohibition. So it applies to only to executives, so sort of fire chief level, um, and also applies to elected officials. And the idea here is obviously that if you have um, these sort of strong relationships by virtue of having been on the board or uh, been in the position of a high executive that you shouldn't use that to the benefit of a private um, employer potentially at the, at the, to the detriment of the public. All right, our next topic here is uh, bribery. We are required to talk about this by the AG. Um, we, you know, we don't like to, but we're required to, so here we go. All right, bribery occurs when anything of value is, is exchanged for a vote, opinion, or action on a pending or a potential matter. So you need quid pro quo, you need the exchange of this for that. And it's important to know under California law that even if a bribe isn't actually received, a meeting of the minds is sufficient. So if there is agreement to give and receive a bribe, that is sufficient to violate the law. Um, the penalties here under California law, imprisonment for one to four years, if no bribe was actually received, a fine of between $2,000 and $10,000. If a bribe was received, double the amount received or up to $10,000, plus the individual will be required to forfeit office and you'd be disqualified from ever holding office in California, um, appointment, employment, anything else in the state, with the state rather. And then the federal corollary to the California bribery laws are known as the federal honest services laws. So where allegations of bribery and kickbacks, so nepotism, perjury, concealing information, obstruction of justice, end up in the federal system is when interstate communications are used. So mail, phone, internet, if someone Venmo's a bribe, that triggers these federal honest services laws. And so uh, it's important to know that violations of honest services laws can often implicate other laws, uh, other federal laws and lead to additional enforcement at the federal level. So racketeering laws, if you see an FBI sting of a local agency and you're wondering what the FBI is doing there, this is very likely what they are doing there, that it is a uh, case of allegations of bribery or kickbacks that involved mail, phone, internet, something along those lines. 
So the penalties for violating honest services laws include up to 20 years in jail and uh, $250,000 in fines. Um, I think it's easy to assume because we're talking about bribery that you know this only happens under the most nefarious of cir circumstances. You kind of imagine like a back alley situation of exchanging an agreement. Uh, but I think it's important to know that really very often where we see allegations of bribery, it often comes up in the context of like a personal professional relationship that crosses the line. So a friendly relationship with someone who does business with the district that goes too far. And so this is an area where we just think it's important to keep your ethics alarm well tuned to these issues. I, I you know, I don't think I'll say that it's easy to stumble into this, but um, you can kind of see and understand how these circumstances co sometimes come up. And uh, it's just important to be extra cautious and aware that it doesn't always uh, come up in really nefarious circumstances. All right, so our takeaways for this topic, always be on the lookout for a conflict. If you have questions, please ask for help. If you ask for help, we will ask lots of questions back. It's not because we're nosy, it's just because we have to wade through those materiality rules and they're complicated. And so we will get through that. Um, the problem and the solution aren't always obvious. This is in an intuitive area of the law. Um, and so we just have to kind of work through that. All right, our next topic here, perks of office. So this section will cover the rules that are designed to prohibit public officials from personally benefiting from their position. So the rules here cover gifts, honoraria, free or discounted travel, and the use of public resources. And then again, it's important to keep in mind that where there's overlapping state law and local policy related to perks of office, the stricter of the two governs. So an agency's more restrictive gift policy will control over the state's rules. So first we're going to talk here about gift limits. The FPPC regulations establish limits on the gifts that public officials may receive and the reporting requirements and conflict of interest um, requirements related to those gifts. The first source for us with gift questions is the FPPC gift guide, which is included in your ethics resource packet. Whenever I get a gift question, it is where I go first. So I always recommend that folks uh, use that. It's a fact sheet. I think it's like 14 pages long. So there's a lot of information there and it is very readable and you can kind of maneuver your way through it. Um, I think it's a really helpful guide. I'm going to provide a really high level um, explanation of the gift rules, but just know that you have that gift guide, which has a lot more detail and can answer many specific questions. So the first question is who do gift limits apply to? They apply to public officials, which are statutory form 700 filers and folks designated in the agency's conflict of interest code. What is a gift? A gift is anything that confers a personal benefit for which you do not provide something of equal or greater value. The gift limit for the 2023-2024 year is $590 per source per calendar year. That's periodically increased. And so the most recent increase brought us up to 590. And then you have a disqualifying conflict of interest if a source involved in a government governmental decision gave you a gift that was over that $590 limit in the 12 months prior to the decision. And public officials must report any gift worth $50 or more. And then there are separate rules for gifts to the district and tickets and things like that. So to determine if something constitutes a gift, first we ask if there's a personal benefit. As I said, the key here is that the official receive some kind of a benefit and didn't provide something of greater or equal value in return. Assuming that there is a personal benefit, then we look to the regs to see whether or not there's some kind of an exception that applies. But in general, food, drinks, services, travel, money, items or other things are gifts, but a particular gift may be exempt if it falls under one of the exceptions that you know we've listed here. Um, so for example, if your friend, if someone you know picks up the tab at a nice lunch, that would be a gift. 
But if you have a standing monthly lunch date with somebody and you alternate picking up the tab each time so that at the end of the year, you've each paid approximately half of the total value, then that would probably be a reciprocal exchange and you wouldn't need to report this as a gift. So what's important to know here as we work through each of these exceptions, and this is what's really useful about the gift guide, is that there's different categories here. So is something a disqualifying conflict of interest if it exceeds the threshold? Is it reportable? Is it, a, uh, is it exempt in some other way? So, you know, sometimes some of the boxes are ticked and not others. And so it's just kind of important to look at the gift guide and understand what exactly the obligations are. Is this subject to the gift limit? Would this be a disqualifying conflict of interest? Is it reportable? Yes, no, that kind of thing. So next we look to consider who is it from to determine whether or not an exception applies. So is it from a family member? Is it from a long-term clo long -term close personal friend, the, the best friends forever exception? Is it a non-agency business relationship? Is it a dating relationship? Any of those categories may be exempt depending on the context. And I say depending on the context because in many of these cases, the exception won't apply if the, the individual otherwise has business before the agency. So if they have business before the agency, it tends to, to um, trump some of these exceptions. For folks who are not statutory filers, are they in your disclosure category? If the gift isn't from someone related to your disclosure category, then it's not, uh, then it would be exempt. You wouldn't have to report it or um, anything along those lines. And then, as I said, um, are they a vendor? Does a special rule apply? Are they a lobbyist? There are other sort of nuances that may trump some of these exceptions. And then who's the gift to? Obviously gifts to you are gifts to you, but a gift to your spouse or your child may also be a gift to you if there isn't an independent basis for that gift. So if someone you know who works with the district um, decides to pay for your child's college tuition and they don't have an independent relationship with that child, then that individual is very likely making a gift to you. It's important to kind of understand where some of those um, other uh, gifts to other folks might be viewed as gifts to you or interpreted as gifts to you under the law. Additionally, if the gift was received as an, at an event, some different exceptions and valuations will apply depending on the nature of the event. So <clears throat> at a public event, free admission, food, and nominal items like a pen, pencil, mouse pad, something like that, that are available to all of the attendees at the event at which you make this speech are uh, would be exempt so long as the uh, as the admission is provided by the person who organizes the event. Um, if you are at a wedding, the same benefits received as a guest attending a wedding reception, um, as the same benefits that others receive, if you receive those benefits, that would be exempt. So if everybody receives a little package of candied almonds, you're probably fine. If everybody receives a little package of candied almonds and you get a really nice box of wine, then that this exception probably would not apply. And then uh, additionally, there's an exception for um, acts of hospitality. So gifts of hospitality, food, drink, occasional lodging aren't gifts when the host and the host family member or the host family member are present and you have a relationship with that host that's unrelated to your official position. So if you have a a friend um, who you've known for a long time and they, you know, have you over for a barbecue, that's likely not a gift. But if, you know, someone you don't know that well offers to let you use their home in Aspen, but they're not going to be there, then that may be a gift. Conferences. Um, so free or reduced registration for informational conferences that, ex that assist the, the official in performing their duties are okay, and these are not gifts. So meals, lodging, and transportation costs are generally considered gifts subject to the gift limits and must be reported and can be disqualifying. If these expenses are paid by a public agency or a 501c3, 
in connection with travel for the governmental purpose. They are not subject to the gift limits, but they are reportable and could be disqualifying. So that's where I said, you know, it kind of depends which category you fall in and the exceptions here. Um, if a gift, if the gift is related to travel and that's made to the district without specifying who it's for and the district controls and uses it, it's not treated as a gift to the individual, but as a gift to the district and the district should maintain a public record of the donor of the gift who used it, that kind of thing in order to comply with the regulations. Um, you should also be aware if you're performing a service in connection with a bona fide business, trade, profession, such as teaching, um, any income earned and payments received for those services are income and wouldn't be a gift or honoraria. And then if your travel expenses for a conference are reimbursed by the agency, don't forget to give a report at the next meeting. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, it was a lot. <laughs> Catch my breath. <laughs> No, what kind you say give a report? Are you talking about give a financial report or give a report on what went on? Or? Oh, it's a report on the on the activity. So I attended okay. this the CSDA conference. It's that kind of a thing. So is that mandatory that, that once you go to company, you come back and it's on the agenda for the next meeting? Or? Right. It's usually not a separate agenda item other than, you know, director reports. That's where oh. you would include it. I attended this meeting. Um, you know, I think you all you all do that regularly at your meetings, report on meetings that you've attended and things like that. That's what this is tied to. Oh, OK. Um, so some tips for managing gifts. Uh, as I said, FPPC fact sheet is an outstanding reference. Um, we also recommend keeping a log of um, your gifts. The FPPC has a gift tracking app. So if you uh, are inclined to, to do that, that's another way to, to keep track. Um, and then to always just be aware of you know, agency policies and whether those might be more rigorous than what's required under the law. Next, um, honoraria. So honoraria are payments made in consideration for giving a speech, publishing an article, or attending an event. Directors, candidates for office, and certain designated agency executives are prohibited from receiving honoraria. Um, individuals who, employees who are designated in the district's conflict of interest code are also prohibited from receiving honoraria if that individual would be required to report the income or gifts from that source on their statement of economic interest. So if this is within your, if uh, the honoraria comes from an entity that's within your disclosure category, then you are also prohibited from accepting that honoraria. Um, expense reimbursement, such as travel and lodging in connection with the speech um, in California is not a report, is not reportable and is not disqualifying. Um, but expense reimbursement for speeches outside of California is reportable and can be disqualifying. So the basic rule here is that you can't make money, but you're not required to lose money. And then there are specific limitations in terms of where the event is and what you are entitled to. So for speeches outside of California, but within the United States, you can get same day plus or minus one day meals, lodging and travel paid for the appearance. Um, it's not subject to the gift limit, but it is reportable and can be disqualifying. Um, speeches at an international location, if it's a for-profit corporation that wishes to pay for airfare or other transportation, that's a gift subject to the limit um, and must be reported, can be disqualifying. And then, as I mentioned before, there are some exceptions to the prohibition on honoraria, and that is if you are performing a bona fide business or profession, like, you know, teaching or something like that, um, artistic performance, um, any money that's paid to the agency general fund within 30 days, and then direct donation to a nonprofit. So someone comes to you and says, thank you so much for giving this speech. We would love to give you $100 for having done this. And you say, so kind of you. Thank you so much. You don't need to give it to me, though, maybe to this uh, charity over here. And then you can't get the tax benefit. You can't be listed as having been the donor, um, be really affiliated with the donation. But if it doesn't touch you and is just directly donated, um, then we haven't violated the uh, honoraria rules. 
All right. So our hypothetical here, our director says, I would like to report that I attended the CSDA conference last week. Obviously, I had this example on my mind. <laughs> I was answering your question, Director Jones. <laughs> and uh, I received reimbursement from the district for my attendance. What a great experience. I learned a ton and made connections with all sorts of firms that could help us. Normally, I'd end my report there, but I have a question. One particular consultant took me and my spouse golfing at an amazing country club, took us out to dinner the next night and on a riverboat cruise. I think the total value here was $800. I can pay him back if I have to, but I think I'm fine because I bought him some drinks at the conference reception <laughs> plus a couple of cups of coffee. I'm good, right? No. <laughs> Not good. I think. Yeah, it seemed like slipping some money here and there, you know. <laughs> no, no. So. Buying a few drinks and coffee, even if it's, you know, really nice blue bottle coffee, it's just not enough. We need to think about that sort of initial question. Did you receive a benefit for which you provided mm -hmm. equal or greater value? And the consideration paid here, the, the obligation is on the official to prove that, to demonstrate that. So here, I think, you know, it's clear you won't be able to reach the burden of demonstrating $800 worth of um, coffee and drinks. <laughs> kind of hard. I know. <laughs> All right. So what do we do with these perks? So you have 30 days to deal with a gift, which means you can return it or donate it. Different from honor area where you can't personally receive it. You could personally receive a gift and then donate um, with honor area. As I said, you can't let it touch you. You just have to direct it away. You must report the gift properly. You could be disqualified from participating in a governmental decision if the source of the gift of nine, uh, $590 or more in the past 12 months is named or will be financially affected by a government decision. Um, and you would need to follow the disclosure and the recusal requirements. Um, penalties for failing to handle uh, perks of office appropriately include fines, $5,000 per violation, um, you know, your own attorney's fees, the other party's attorney's fees. Uh, it can be pretty costly. Excuse me, Nicole. Mm -hmm. it, seemed like, it seemed like that would be um, a little difficult to, to even to track. I mean, if say for example, a person goes to a conference, they 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 turn in their 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 I guess expenditure report and what they what they spend money on. It, you know, I, you know, I guess it would really it, it's staffing, I guess, at whoever received those documents, uh somehow it it, it seemed like it, it doesn't really filter back up to the board. It just goes right into the financial or a process of processing things financially. And, and it, uh, I mean, is that typically how it, how, how it happens? Uh, I mean, where, where does the accountability come into play? I mean, who, who does the accountable, um, the, the checking kind of thing that, that goes mm -hmm. on? So a little bit two different two different issues there. One is reimbursement, right? And making sure that you're complying with the reimbursement rules. That's, you know, but under both, instances, whether we're talking about gifts or we're talking about reimbursement, the accountability is with the individual, the public official who's responsible for making the disclosure and complying with the rules. And I think, you know, this isn't exactly a one-to-one -one example, but when we were talking before about bribery and how it's easy to sort of find uh, how, how these situations tend to come up more often than not, what you see are things like vendors who have a personal relationship with a public official who are then making gifts and those gifts aren't reported and those gifts are very much in excess of the gift limits and then then those individuals start getting government contracts and you have facts that lead you to an allegation of bribery so these things do start to overlap and while i agree with you that you can you can imagine a scenario where gifts are received and it just flies under the radar. Those things do very often come to light. And when they do come to light, it can show a record that ends up being much worse than just sort of simple gift, um, gift giving or failure to comply with gift requirements. So that's part of the reason why, frankly, I think the 
taking the responsibility, going through the steps, keeping a GIF log, doing all of that, not only, you know, make sure that you're in compliance with the law, but frankly protects you because if and when there is an allegation, you have your record that says, nope, I did not accept that gift or here was my reciprocal exchange or here's why it doesn't, uh, why it, it's subject to an exception. You've gone through the process, you've thought about it um, and you're better protected against any kind of claim of, um, of an improper activity or an improper gift. So it helps you comply with the law and helps you, helps you um, protect yourself as well, I think. Okay. Thank you. All right, our next topic here, uh, the constitutional ban on free or discounted transportation. This is, I think, my number one favorite topic to talk about just because of this picture in the slide, nothing else. <laughs> so, all right, there under the California Constitution, the, um, a transportation company may not grant free passes or discounts to anyone holding office in the state. And the acceptance of a pass or discount by a public officer will work a forfeiture of that office. So this is a progressive era law really meant to target bad behavior by robber barons who were occurring favor with public officials. So this picture here, this is our robber baron. <laughs> and the important thing to know here is that it's okay for a district officer to ride for free on district vehicles in order to monitor the district services, but it's not okay to accept free or discounted transportation from transportation carriers if you've received it by virtue of your office. So a frequent flyer ticket because you have accrued a certain number of miles with one airline is fine because that's not a gift or it's not a, it's not coming to you by virtue of your office. It's coming to you because you've flown so many times with that airline that you have uh, received this frequent flyer ticket. The contrary to that would be a, an example. So BART gave free passes to city council members and others with the grand opening of the SFO extension. And that caused a lot of attorneys to ask whether or not um, mm -hmm. those passes could be used. And I think the prudent approach is that if you got the offer for transportation because of your position, and you're not monitoring or otherwise serving your agency by using it, you should probably reject the offer and pay your own way. And you know, obviously that's important because the penalty here is just right there in the language. It will work a forfeiture of the office. So that's really it. It's pretty straightforward, wow. I guess, but that's what yeah. we have there. All right, uh, use of public resources. So this covers, funds, money, surplus property, staff time, copiers, phones, some of the sort of uh, less straightforward examples. I think um, this kind of tends to be the area, the most sort of slippery slope area we see in practicing law for public agencies. And I think that's because most of the time, you know, while we understand logically, I think that using public resources for personal or political ends is theft, the context that often comes up um, really makes it, uh, folks have an easy time or maybe are inclined to have an easy time to explain away the action as being de minimis or not really worthy of concern or maybe there's not really a value to whatever's being taken. And so that's how we kind of see the slippery slope. So even though we know this is you know, particularly egregious, we still see these you know, really terrible stories of, um, you know, kind of blatant misuse of public resources. And then we see some of the smaller examples um, that I was talking about before. So it's important to just know that, you know, this applies to um, use of public resources by an employee or an officer or the gift of public funds by an employee or officer to someone who is outside of the agency, whether that's a family member, nonprofit, agency retiree, any other person or, or organization, that's what we're talking about here. But also, um, also like, I don't know, like, you know, the fire stations have workout rooms that would include that kind of, is that considered- Misuse the of the resources. I think that that's a perfect example of one of those that I think folks would have would be inclined to justify as not having a 
value. And I would argue, you know, the equipment in the exercise room has a certain amount of, you know, the treadmill can only take so many miles <laughs> someone's running on it before uh, it breaks. And if you are letting folks come in and use I mean, it, even like the elected people, right? Or other anyone, elected officials, anyone that's not anyone like an Anyone who employee. shouldn't be using it, letting folks use it when that's not what's intended, I think can be a little bit risky. So I, that's that's the context where I think it's really more important that folks sort of challenge themselves to think about what the value and the cost might be. Although I think it is, uh, you know, as you go down this road, it becomes more and more gray and more and more yeah, difficult but at the end to, of the day, to pinpoint. Tax, right. But at the end of the day, tax dollars were spent to buy the equipment, mm -hmm. right? I mean, in the, in the facility. So to me, it's still like a public facility. Yeah, no, I think I think you're right. I think it's a uh, it it is definitely one of those one of these I, I guess soft isn't quite the right term, but one of these more gray areas where you need to be extra tuned to it because there definitely can be a cost and a price. Um, and you know, you can lead to misuse of resources here. So in addition to those types of examples, I think staff time, it's important to know staff time is public mm -hmm. time. So not using staff time for the agency's business would be a misuse of public resources or really misusing, I think misusing kind of <clears throat> the equipment was the example that you were giving, um, Director Chin Crowley. And I think there you have to think about, you know, is this use actually de minimis or does it have a value and an impact? And so the facts are going to come into play to determine whether or not um, something is misuse of public resources in that context. Nicole, what, mm -hmm. what if uh, resident equipment, what if, you know, uh, once a week I may come in and sit down and take a vacant desk and spend an hour or two kind of doing, you know, whether it's, you know, district business or in the, in between there are some some own personal business is that would that include in terms of in terms of resources appropriate use of resources at that for that particular use so i guess if we're talking about if the question is about like the desk and the space that you're you know the chair that you're sitting right. in and the desk that you're posted up at um, I have a hard time seeing how that would be a misuse of public resources because unless there's like somebody else who can't come in and do their work because <laughs> that desk is cool. being occupied or something like that, right? right. Um, otherwise, you're sort of sitting in a space and you are arguably, you know, they're doing in part the agency's business and also maybe doing a little bit of other things. So in that that context, that seems less concerning to me. Um, you know, if you were, sorry, I had another example where that was more egregious, but that just left my mind. Um, so yeah, I'll, I guess I'll leave it there because I okay. forgot my other example. <laughs> just... but so Nicole, just a really quick question about this. This is specifically for um, personal or political use of these public right. resources because so i know that for nonprofit organizations for example we have helped nonprofits by allowing them to use um like the classroom at station one as a meeting place mm -hmm. and i mean you know and like for i, I don't even I, I can't i'm trying to think of a nonprofit thing i i because I, I mean it hasn't been it's been so long i can't even remember but i do remember that at one point that was okay because it was a nonprofit organization. Well, and I think in that context, you would think about whether or not something is a gift of public funds, and that would be the analysis that you would work under. And so in that context, there is a fair amount of legislative discretion that's given to the agency in making that determination of whether or not there's a, a a governmental purpose that's being served. So you could okay. see how for something like a fire district where community engagement and involvement is paramount, that having like allowing that kind of community access could serve that purpose. So that mm -hmm. it's a slightly different analysis and a slightly different look. Um, I guess for all of these things, the takeaway is to ask questions and to think about it and to give it some careful thought and not just assume that something's fine. It very well may be, okay, but not just assume, you. I think. Right. Um, okay, and then we have an example that I 
you know, have sort of been enjoying using lately. There was a public employee, a library employee, who was alleged to have stolen over a million dollars worth of printer toner. And in that case, we the facts there were that this individual, you know, over the course of many years, stole what really must have been just a huge amount of printer toner. <laughs> And the agency in, you know, in addition to the individual obviously being um, charged, the agency really was hit as well because the agency, there's, a, there was a record of folks having said to this person, like, you can't show up early. Um, there's nobody here to supervise you at that time. And yet he just continued to do it. And the agency didn't take further steps. Um, that there there were other branches of the library that were, you know, saying like, oh, I don't, we don't have enough printer toner and no one was sort of taking that closer look. So these issues, while obviously the responsibility of the individual who's, who is taking the action, um, can definitely implicate the agency and result in greater scrutiny um, of the agency and its practices and procedures. So it's just important, you know, from the agency perspective, from the individual perspective, to kind of keep an eye on this issue. Um, and then I guess lastly, I would just say that I think the only thing I didn't mention here is surplus property. This is another area where uh, it's just really important to make sure that you're following the agency's surplus property, uh, disposition of surplus property policy um to avoid any kind of uh appearance of impropriety or other issues all right uh mass mailing prohibition so state law specifically prohibits uh newsletter or other mass mailing at public expense and so this is particularly important when you're looking at political and campaign issues and the main point is really to avoid uh, officials using their public office to build their own reputation in advance of an election. So the, you know, there's a number of different exceptions and nuances, and you have to be particularly careful navigating this um, particular prohibition. So the mass mailing prohibition in specific, it basically prohibits uh, newsletters or mass mailings at public expense, which feature the name, picture, or other reference to an elected official, and it's 200 or more substantially similar tangible items in a month. So this wouldn't apply to something like an email um, and also doesn't apply to things like legally required notices or announcements. Um, where we have seen enforcement activities, I mean, it's unfortunate, but it tends to be in, you know, related to like holiday cards and things like that, um, where we've seen some enforcement action of late. campaign and political um, activities. With social media. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, mm -hmm. Nicole, with no, social no. media, um, I don't know. Count in that context? Count, yeah. No, it's not tangible. It needs to be a tangible item. Okay. And then you can hold in your hand. Okay, got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so no public funds may be used to promote partisan positions in an election campaign, whether it's personal or a measure or a proposition. Informational materials that are factual balance and that don't advocate a particular uh, position are permitted. Public agency resources such as phones, supplies, fax, machine, fax machines, computers, can't be used to advocate for political candidates or ballot measures. And then improper use of public funds may trigger, trigger civil fines or criminal penalties. It applies across the board to elected officials, appointed officials, public employees. Um, individuals may engage in political activities on their own time and outside the scope of their agency activities or official functions. Um, district officers and employees may reference their agency titles in campaign communications supporting their own candidacies. District officers and employees may also refer to their agency titles in campaign materials, printed or electronic materials, endorsing other candidates and ballot measures. But in these cases, we recommend that the officer or employee include um, a notation stating that, you know, the use of their title is just for identification purposes. Um, and it also prohibit, the law also prohibits um, officers or employees of local agencies from soliciting 
um, soliciting political, excuse me, contributions from officers or employees. Um, it's important to know that there has been a lot of activity in this area. The FPPC has deployed this new tool called FPPC Ad Watch, and we've seen a lot of action around um, public agencies and whether or not their um, informational materials related to ballot measures are in fact informational materials or if they cross the line into partisan campaigning. Um, and the this tool, the FEPC Ad Watch, gives folks the opportunity to kind of just report and submit complaints about anything that they've uh, noticed by public agencies and the enforcement division reviews all of these. Um, so this is a this is an area where there's been quite a bit of action um, from the enforcement space. Nicole, so Nicole oh, go on, Bob, Robert. Could you uh, maybe uh, I'm a little slow on this one somewhat, but could you uh, go through bullet point number uh, three down and then connecting that with the uh, the can'ts. Um, are you seeing that that um, information materials, factual balance, mm -hmm. uh, and et cetera, do not advocate? Mm -hmm. um, so if if materials was written up in the name of someone, is that is that uh, materially participating in that 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 document, or is it an indirect oh, they quoted me in, in, in this document for or against a particular situation. Um, how, how, do, how, do, how did that work in so far as the person that's being quoted is, I mean, how, how do you free yourself from the, 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 the um, displacement of, of your association in this particular document that's that's advocating a position uh because i see that where it's, they can't use resource to advocate or campaign for a local ballot measure it seems like there's a there's a, those that it's a thin line between or maybe it's not in terms of the appearance of 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 a person participating when they say they may say that oh i didn't I didn't write this. I didn't, you know, it was wrote in, it was wrote in my name, uh, quoting certain things. Uh, how do you, how do you, as, as a director or as an elected official, how do you, how do you dis, how do you distance yourself from, from that activity? Does so that I think, sense? I, I think so. And I want to answer, I guess, looking at these two bullet points, um, what these are really getting at are materials distributed by the agency. So an agency, so there's a bond measure on the ballot and the agency distributes informational materials about that bond measure and the informational materials are factual. These are the, this is what's going to happen if this measure passes. This is what's going to happen if this measure doesn't pass. Um, and it's factual, it's balanced, it doesn't advocate one way or another. And there's a specific test that would apply called the time, tone, and tenor test, mm -hmm. uh, which is helpful. Yeah. Um, at this point in the training, when I've gone through 51 slides and can <laughs> barely keep my... <laughs> but um, the, the key point there is that something that is considered factual and balanced and not advocating you know, months in advance of an election may have a different spin on it in the days right before the election. So that that's an analysis that a court would do related to materials that are distributed or produced by the agency. And similarly, that can't use resources. That's public agency resources. And I think if I'm understanding your question correctly, it's about you're getting at other folks taking a director's statement and using that either out of context or in a way that advocates for a position. Um, if it's not the public agency, it's, if it's not public agency resources that are being used, then I think it's more a matter, then it's it's kind of a separate question and a separate issue altogether. It's more a matter of making sure that you're 
that uh, you know either your that your statements or anything like that are being represented in a way that's accurate. But that that's a that's mm -hmm. not a misuse of public resources question. Okay. Well, let me ask you this: as public agency piggybacking mm -hmm. off of Robert. Let's say that there's something that's about an, a ballot initiative, and there's a link about the person of the elected officials bio that goes directly to the public agency's website would that be a use of public agency resources because the website is run by the public agency and paid for by tax dollars um you know i think i would have to say and, that... and it makes it look like the public agency is taking a position when the public agency has not and it is intentionally not. I'm just mm -hmm. curious. No, no, I've I seen understand. That all over the place. Mm -hmm. No, I, I definitely understand the question. And I will say that I think I will decline to answer just because I think it would be fact specific and I'd have to take a closer look to be sure. And I don't want to misspeak in this context. Okay. Um, great. so we could certainly loop back with a little bit more context and details on what the rules of the road are um, for linking to an agency site um but you know yeah i even as i'm sitting here i'm kind of thinking through all the different angles on it and i think there's more to consider so, so yeah okay it's, it's the resources that are used of the agency of the fire district in this case in, in this situation you're referring to yes rather than um an, an individual person uh, through some other source or some other uh, group or that may be associated with um, quoting certain things about, you know, a perception of what the district might do uh, without getting an actual position from the, the district itself of what its thoughts are on the issues. It's, it's, it seems like it's just two separate separate situations, yeah. I, well, I think, let me just see if I'm understanding it correctly, Nicole, like we have to put on our, the, on our ballot, put out on the ballot, something about passing the GAN limit, right? So when we're, when, when that's out there, we cannot use district resources to make phone calls to constituents to help vote for the passage of the GAN limit, right? It's that kind of thing that this is prohibiting couldn't use agency phone call phones that's right that's to right do like phones that from kind of thing the fire public, district yes. or public agency resources right. is the focus of that's this because you yeah. okay. it's public fund that's that first line right public funds for partisan campaigning that's what that's what this is sort of tightly focused on and i yeah. i appreciate that this you know can kind of go in a lot of different directions that get increasingly more complicated and so i i think it's it's definitely something, especially given the, the time <laughs> that probably warrants um, a more feedback and response if, yeah. if needed. I get it, I get Thank it. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Yeah, Nicole? Uh, yes. Yes, Rob. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there was an incident where when we were uh, doing a Measure V campaign that there were some links that went to the actual uh, website or a fire district on some solicitations. So, you know, what I want to uh, uh, act probably recommend that that if uh, any board members feel that there were some improprieties done by any of our board members, that they should just contact political practices and file a formal complaint. Thank you, Nicole. All right. So the next topic here is compensation and reimbursement policies. So the district's enabling legislation establishes compensation of directors and the expense reimbursement requirements of the law. Lots of agencies already had these requirements and have for a long time, but it's now mandated under AB 1234 um, related to a scandal of the city of Bell and um, all sorts of other issues that were happening there. But the the sort of fundamental piece of it is that expense reimbursement may be permitted for actual and necessary expenses incurred in the performance of official duties. 
requests for expense reimbursement that go beyond what's authorized equates to a gift of public funds or taking. And it's important to know that the district's policies describe what's covered, rates and limits, required documentation, that sort of thing. And then the uh, criminal and civil penalties that apply for unlawful use of public resources include prison terms, permanent disqualification from office, fines of up to $1,000 per day, the violation occurs plus three times the value of the resource used. So um, this really applies to directors and anyone else who gets reimbursement. And um, it's just important to make sure that you're following districts adopted policies and procedures um, all along the way. All right, so our hypothetical here. Our director says, as you all know, I'm up for re-election this year. I'd like to thank staff for making the old computers in the bunker available to me. We put them to good use. Staff has made copies of the flyers for one of my upcoming fundraising lunches, and I encourage everyone to pick up a flyer and to attend legal counsel. It was okay that I announced this here, right? So this really focuses on that issue of public resources, right? So we're talking about a statement from the dais using agency um, equipment, using staff time all for a political purpose, just really kind of squarely public resources and unauthorized campaigning here. It sounds like he just needs to pick which sale he want to go into. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, so I appreciate, I am mindful of the time. I appreciate you all um, continuing to give me your time and attention. We have just a few more slides to go through. This last topic here is fair processes and procedures. So the idea here is that government processes should be fair and consistently applied to avoid any kind of bias and favoritism. And it includes things like not, not participating in decisions involving family members, avoiding any kind of acts of nepotism. The laws here relate to constitutional due process, statutes and rules and policies related to competitive bidding, fares, rates and charges, and then incompatible offices and activities. So really what due process re requires here is that um, individuals may not be deprived of life, liberty, or, prop or property without due process, which is notice the opportunity to be heard and to receive a fair and impartial hearing. Um, this often comes up in the context of employee terminations and non-responsibility non determinations of bidders, and that's because those are tied to, at least in the case of you know, responsibility determinations, we're talking about um, reputational impacts of property interest. And so um, being sure in those contexts that we are clearly following established rules and procedures, the best way to make sure that in fact, we're complying with the requirements of due process. And I think it's also important, important to note that um, due process, you know, it has, it, it's, um, it's not really something that you can just kind of paper. There is a case where um, you had, I think, a planning commission hearing, a zoning variance and request, and the during the meeting, the planning commissioners could be seen on film, you know, on their phones, talking to each other, getting up, getting coffee, just very clearly not listening to the individual who was there um, waiting to be heard. And when the court looked at that, they just said, you're not really giving this person an opportunity to be heard. You're just kind of going through the motions. So uh, it's important to make sure that, in fact, uh, we're doing everything that we should in giving this the attention and the deference that it deserves. Uh, next, competitive bidding. Um, the principle here is that public money should be for the public good and uh, without any discrimination or favoritism. There are state laws that govern the requirements related to public agencies and public, uh, and I'm sorry, and competitive bidding. And in addition to that, there can be local requirements, agency requirements, federal grant rules, but essentially the elements tend to be no conflicts of interest, um, maintaining confidentiality during the procurement process to preserve the procurement process and not permitting any ex parte communication. So not giving someone the opportunity to, you know, sidle up and lobby their cause um, outside of, uh, you know, a, a public meeting where everybody has the, the opportunity to, to speak and to be heard. 
incompatible offices and activities. This really uh, gets at significant clashes of duties or loyalties between offices. So the statute here provides that a public officer shall not simultaneously hold two public offices that are incompatible. And offices are incompatible when any of the following circumstances are present unless it's expressly permitted by law or compelled. So either of the offices may audit, overrule, or remove members of, dismiss employees of, or exercise directory powers over the other officer body. Based on the powers and jurisdiction of the officers, there's a possibility of a significant clash of duties or loyal loyalties between the offices, and public policy considerations make it improper for one person to hold both offices. When two offices are incompatible, the public can um, request approval to bring a lawsuit from the AG. And once approved, um, if it's successful, the, end of the official would be removed from the first office. Um, so this doesn't apply to positions of employment, including any kind of civil service positions, um, and doesn't apply to any governmental bodies that only have advisory powers. And then lastly, incompatible activities. This is similar, but it's usually created by agency policy. So, um, you know, you may have an agency policy that says that a city police officer can't act as a private security guard in their spare time. All right, key lessons here. We are nearing the end. <laughs> Pay attention to your ethical compass. It is a uh, guide both to understanding how to sort of successfully work with your colleagues, but also understanding what um, what you feel is appropriate and, and appropriate within the bounds of the law. And um, if in general, if something doesn't feel quite right or you need to ask, chances are there's a there's a problem, and it's worth worth asking the questions. Um, appearances should set the standard. You want to avoid even the appearance of impropriety. Um, the strictest rule govern, governs when it comes to perks of office. And I think the one that I really like the most here is the laws may change, but values don't. So you understand what, um, what are the things that your ethical compass tells you are right and wrong. Those values, the values of your community, those things uh, really don't change. The law you know, may change to some degree or another, but the, the values don't. And please reach out for help if you need it. We are here. The FPPC has resources for you. Um, and you should just feel free to do so. All right. Thank you, Nicole. Any questions no from the directors? Robert? Um, Robert? No, I don't have any questions. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I uh, thank you, Nicole. It was very, very good. I'm I may have asked too many questions, forgive me for that. <laughs> I am a curious person. <laughs> Always welcome. Rob? Hey, well, if there aren't any more questions, well, I don't know, Chief? No, no questions for me. Okay. Thank you, Nicole. <laughs> Appreciate it. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Nicole. So um, I thought that, that this was great, and it was that was the only item on here, and it's 7.05, so if there are no other questions or comments, then I'll adjourn the meeting. Does that work? Should I work Michelle. for me? <laughs>